Hello, and welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. I'm Father Gregory Pine, and we're doing something a little bit new here. So we had a lot of questions from students at these live lectures, you know, on themes of philosophy and theology. But as a listener, I think a lot of folks tuning into the podcast were formulating their own questions as they were following along with the audio and then sometimes online with the video. And so we thought that we would have a new opportunity here to follow up further with some of the speakers. So each two weeks, uh, we're going to start out with each two weeks, I'll be hosting one of our Thomistic Institute speakers um, so that we can dive deeper on a theme that he or she has entertained in the context of a conference or an on-campus lecture or, uh, yeah, an, another setting, maybe, maybe perhaps something that we've done over the summer. So for this, our first episode of uh, the Thomistic Institute podcast, uh, we are going to have uh, Professor Jen Frey, uh, who many of you will have known from lectures that she's given that have been on the podcast before or from conferences to which she has contributed. So Professor Frey, so, uh, so delighted to have you on. Yeah, I'm thrilled. Hi. <laughs> Dig. So, so, so many of our, our listeners will, will know you from those things already, but if you would, maybe just give a little introduction, who you are, where you're from, what you're up to, kind of what you're engaged in presently, both, both academically and popularly. Sure. So I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina, which means that I live in Columbia, South Carolina, where it is currently extremely hot and humid. And uh, I work on moral philosophy, but also Aquinas and action theory. And lately I've been dabbling in philosophical jurisprudence um, and writing a lot about higher ed and sort of what you might just call something like philosophy of education. I've been thinking a lot about the liberal arts uh, and why we should support them how they're different from uh, anything else you might study. And uh, yeah, that's kind of what I do. I have a bunch of kids and some chicken. <laughs> um, wonderful. Cheers. That's great. Um, so we're going to follow up on a lecture that you gave just this past semester, uh, the title of which is What Makes a Person Good? Aquinas and the Cardinal Virtues. So virtue is a theme that we talk about a lot uh, in Thomistic Institute settings. Um, but you, uh, who, who learn much from Aristotle, Aquinas, and Anscombe, your three A's, uh, have some, you know, especially excellent insights in this lecture, which was nice, a kind of compact unity, and I benefited much from listening to it. So while I was not present uh, physically, I was able to, yeah, derive great fruit in the aftermarket. Um, so in, in the first kind of section of the lecture, you're talking a little bit about the uncoupling of morality and happiness, um, and you were just kind of alluding to a difference between ethics of obligation and then a kind of ethics of happiness or ethics of eudaimonia. Um, so kind of just in listening to it, as I'm pondering about my own experience or conversations with other people, I think part of the reason why morality and happiness come apart in our experience is that we often only think of morality as touching part of our lives and then as happiness as touching another part of our lives. Now, like, albeit with some overlap, but people tend to think like, okay, morality concerns like church stuff and like giving money to poor people and like not raising my voice in anger and happiness concerns like water parks and vacations um, and maybe not feeling terrible when I wake up in the morning. But what they, what they have mm -hmm. to say to each other, not entirely clear. Um, so maybe in light of yeah. this, drawing on the insights of those from whom you learn, what part of the human experience does morality cover or how can we think about morality in such a way that it interfaces more closely with happiness or that that conversation is more rich. So whatever you want to, whatever you want to talk about in that zone. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to talk about here and I guess I'll just start by saying that historically speaking, you know, this division between morality and prudence, this kind of dualism of practical reason uh, which leads to a compartmentalization of the practical life, this is really the legacy of modern moral philosophy. Um, and, you know, we could get into scholarly debates about where to locate it, but um, it's just, it's very foreign to people like Aristotle and St. Thomas. Um, they don't have this dualism between, you know, acting rationally in the sense of self-interest, uh, acting prudently, which is supposedly the same thing, and then acting 
in this super special way, morally, right? I mean, they just, I mean, for them um, to act morally, I mean, I don't think morality is a concept that, that Aristotle really has. And morality in the modern sense, Aquinas doesn't have it either. Um, for them, you know, if we're talking about what today we would call morality, for them, it's just right practical reasoning unqualified <laughs> like like are you reasoning well in the practical life right that's and there's no like super special area that involves so-called moral obligations um any human act that you perform in the human way that is to say voluntarily so in some way that it involves uh your intellectual capacities practical reason and will um you're acting morally, right? It's, it's either good or bad, right? So in doing this Zoom call with you right now, I'm either acting well or I'm not, right? Um, it's just, you know, in eating oatmeal this morning, I was either acting well or I wasn't, right? Um, and, you know, and then there's a long historical story about how we came to this more dualistic picture um, but one of the things that I try to do in my own work, uh, and, and by my own work, I mean both my scholarly work and also the work with, that I do with students uh, on campuses, just talking to them about, you know, the right way to think about stuff. Um, I try to overcome this dichotomy, you know, and just get them to think in terms of what does it mean to think and feel and act in ways that you could call living well for a human being, or that you could characterize in terms of objective human flourishing, right? Because that's what Aristotle meant by happiness or eudaimonia, and that's what St. Thomas meant as well. Um, and of course, that includes everything that we would now call morality, you know, like keeping your promises and uh, not murdering people and um, <laughs> stuff like this, stuff that, you know, sort of justice stuff uh, or the way that we interact with other people. Um, but, but again, it's, it's all of, I mean, in a way, it's all of a piece with what should I study in college, <laughs> right? What, what's valuable? What's good? Um, what is the best way for me to be living given my talents, my uh, circumstances, like what's ready to hand, you know, um, all of that is morality or the moral life or the practical life. It's all. Um, so for me, it's all the same. And one of the things that actually I'm working on right now uh, something that's actually due on Mondays. I'm, I'm responding to um, a book that is a, a, a kind of summation of the last 50 years of social scientific work on happiness. Mm. Um, and what you find in all social scientific work on happiness, whether it's economics or whether it's sociology or whether it's psychology, whatever, is you'll find a conception of happiness where it is one part of human life. Mm -hmm. And there are different ways of operationalizing happiness, but for the social sciences, for all of them, it boils down to subjective psychological states. And there are debates about, well, which kinds of states is it, like, is it just pleasure? And there really are people, <laughs> a lot of people who will still say, that happiness is just having, in the final calculus, like more pleasure than pain states. Um, that's a pretty crude picture, in my opinion. Um, but the more sophisticated theories will add like some kind of cognitive assessment. Like how do I how do I think my life is going on the whole? There's some like life assessment measure that gets thrown in there, and then for other people. Um, it's more about your overall emotional affect picture. So like we can say that we can give some complicated picture about your emotional affect, but at the end of the day, you're happy if like you're more cheerful than not, you know? And so you end up with this picture of happiness 
where you can't really distinguish between what I would call like shallow and deep or silly versus serious conceptions of happiness. Um, And at any rate, it's basically a mess because it's all based on self-reports. And we know for a fact that people are very bad judges of reporting their own psychology. Like it's it's just true. Um, And so, but the trouble is that there's this huge movement um, to craft social policy and public policy based on the so-called science of happiness. And, um, and one of the problems that you run into and that this book is about and that I'm kind of responding to is the conflict between pursuing happiness and pursuing justice or <laughs> pursuing like other things that we value, right? Um, and you, you will always run into these conflicts once you have the dichotomy that I'm trying to get rid of, right? Um, and so it's like, I'm only pro-happiness insofar as we're talking about eudaimonia. Otherwise, it's like happiness is fine, but it's just not that important or serious. That was kind of a long response, sorry. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, no, I, I am for it. I am 100% for it. The things which beget the happiness, which happiness is thick and eudaimonic. Um, it maybe just like thinking about this a little more, teasing out some of the implications. So based on your description, all of human life is moral. And so insofar as morality just describes like the character or quality of a life in pursuit of a particular good, which gives it shape or which gives it sense. If we're going to use maybe more like 19th century, 20th century language. Um, so what you're, what you're concerned with is the goods which perfect the human person, which build him or her up you know, in the interior life and the exterior life and the social relations, which is manifest in virtues. Okay. So like, there's a sense in which we have some control over that sense in which we don't have control over all of that. And I'm thinking of like Aristotle on luck and fortune or chance or however you have it described. Um, so to what extent, you know, we as human beings, to what extent are we, are we responsible for, for the whole of it or the, the all of it? Because all right, just reading, reading Aristotle about what constitutes a virtuous person. On the one hand, he's talking about, like, magnanimity. And on the other hand, he's talking about, like, <laughs> um, what, like, the, the, your gait, you know, the depth of your voice and things like that. We're like, what? Um, so, so, your, so to what extent are we responsible? Your physical beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Aristotle thinks you can't really be happy if you're super ugly. <laughs> he says that. He just says savage. it. He says it. The man is just... He just gets mm-hmm. out and just just goes for the savage points. Um, so okay, I'm yeah. I'm thinking in terms of our our human experience in the 21st century, and maybe you're in a church circle where you're with people who are what we would call normal, and people who would be like a little less normal. Um, <laughs> and we're like, it's okay because they're basically holy, or they're basically pursuing happiness, or they're basically good people. So, is that true? Like, to what extent is conversational facility, or to what extent is hygiene? Or to what extent are these endearing quirks that we have labeled endearing quirks, which in truth are actually annoying quirks? Like, what, to what extent are we responsible for those? How do those play a part in the life of virtue, the life of happiness, the life of, you know, morality, broadly so-called? Yeah, so I think, you know, you're starting to kind of bump up against what I think is a difference between the pagans and the Christians. So, um, but may, I mean... But actually, even within the pagans, right? I mean, you have kind of the stoic view where you're fully in control of whether or not you're happy because happiness is just inner beauty. And like you may be on the rack being tortured, um, but if you're wise, if you're a stoic sage, like, damn it, you're happy. Um, That's a view, right? That's not a view that many people find plausible. Um, And certainly Aristotle uh, just vehemently objects to this. I mean, Aristotle is very clear in the Nicomachean Ethics that um, whether or not we can say you lived a eudaimon life is one, a judgment we can't really make till you're dead. And two, um, even then it's a little bit iffy because what if your children like you know, ruin your name. (laughs) And, and then also, um, he gives this, I mean, Aristotle believes in the tragic, right? So he gives this example of King, King Priam, you know, and he says, 
Well, Priam was a great man, but obviously his life was not Eudaimon. No one would say it was a Eudaimon life. Um, and it just wasn't his fault. And that's just a thing that can happen. So for Aristotle, eudaimonia is a chancy and a finite thing, right? Um, and it's just not totally up to you. Um, it's up to you to a certain extent, right? If, if you're going to live a eudaimon life, um, then that will be because you cultivated and exercised the virtues also because you were raised in a decent society. I mean, that's another thing that might happen. Aristotle thinks, well, you might be a barbarian and, you know, obviously you're not going to live well. Uh, so, so he has a, I mean, yeah, for Aristotle, happiness is a chancy thing. It's vulnerable. Human goodness in general, it's fragile, right? Um, and then, you know, I think one of the things that happens when some of these ideas get taken up into Christianity um, is that it gets, uh, this, this kind of eudaimonistic framework gets married with a Christian commitment to providence, right? And also a Christian commitment to uh, happiness being um, something that you can have in an eternal sense, right? That, you're, that your full happiness um, is, is only had with God, you know, when you have complete union with God and, uh, that's not a chancy thing, right? Um, that's not a finite thing. Um, and that has to do with the nature of the good, right? Which is God. So, um, so I think, and then once you have also the commitment to providence, this idea that, um, the cosmos and you as a part of the cosmos are part of a providential order, right? That reflects God's, uh, we might say practical wisdom. Um, then, right, no matter how bad things look in the moment, <laughs> right? Things look like they're going really badly for you. Uh, you're suffering a lot. It doesn't look like you're flourishing. Um, you have faith and hope um, that this is part of a well-ordered reality that maybe you don't understand right now, but, you know, it's, it's part of a plan. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, your, your full flourishing isn't found in whatever it is that you're doing now or that you're experiencing now, but again, in your communion with God for eternity. And so... Obviously, that's going to change the way that you think about this. And so, for example, in St. Thomas makes a distinction between imperfect happiness and perfect happiness. And he says, well, Aristotle is talking about the imperfect stuff. Now, Aquinas is also keen to emphasize that imperfect happiness is still really important and really good, right? Um, but it's not the most you can hope for. Whereas for Aristotle, it is basically the most you can hope for. I want to, let's see, I want to drill down on the connection between imperfect and perfect happiness. Why do I want to do that? I want to do that because I think in a lot of individual persons, like subjective, sub, blah, 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 subjective experience of happiness and its pursuit, you have on the one hand, like a sense for the grandeur of the Christian claim, namely that you are created mm -hmm. by God for God, that you are capable of God, and that ultimately, by knowledge and by love, you can be in, like assimilated to the divine life mm -hmm. itself in some really significant way. And then on the mm -hmm. other hand, we experience the kind of humdrum, quotidian, banal, otherwise vacuous experience of the, like the everyday. And uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like I am caught up in that dramatic going forth from and returning to. And what I experience of imperfect happiness seems to have very little to do with the perfect happiness that I have described for me in the Gospels um, and, you know, like by whichever kind of Christian preacher or evangelist who is uh, describing them in very exalted terms. So, um, yeah, I guess maybe, maybe thinking about it again in the terms that you set out. So 
imperfect imperfect happiness also like s- situating this within the context of the providence of God um, like how does the Christian experience the present striving for imperfect happiness in connection with or in continuity with a kind of overall narrative arc whereby we are striving for that perfect happiness as it is you know made manifest and communicable to us in the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ what would be like yeah some principles that you would use or some arguments that you would advance or yeah, some counsel that you would give to the ordinary Christian? Well, the arguments in the council would probably be different. But, yeah. um, I mean, in terms of... I mean, some people think that the very idea of holding out for perfect happiness is almost a kind of immaturity. It's like a refusal to reconcile yourself to the fact that, you know, this life is all you have or, or, or just like your materiality and your animality and, you know, that you're just a bunch of stuff at the end of the day. Um, obviously I don't think that, um, I don't think that I'm just a bunch of stuff. Um, I think that I have a rational soul and then I think that certain implications follow from that. Um, but that would be a slightly different conversation. Um, but I think in terms of how to understand the relationship between imperfect happiness and perfect happiness, I think one, you just have to understand that, um, the best that you can get in this life isn't the best that you can get. Right. And so I often speak of like, you know, experiencing like a foretaste of heaven. So when I think about the times that I have been like most joyful in the serious sense or most happy in the serious sense, um, I always think like, wow, well, if this can be so amazing, you know, (laughs) imagine what perfect happiness must feel like. And there is, I mean, I'm very hard on subjectivism because I think it's shallow and stupid, but there is a subjective component to happiness, right? It is a, it is a lived experience that feels good, right? Like if you're happy, um, yeah, it's not tremendously painful, um, and that's that sort of that reality is one reason why the Stoic view doesn't really appeal to me that much. Um, it seems like if you're being drawn and quartered, <laughs> you know, that seems like a deeply unpleasant experience that uh, is hard to describe as, as human flourishing, um, even if your inner beauty is totally intact, right? Um, <clears throat> it seems like a rough thing is happening to you. And there needs to be ways of acknowledging that, uh, yeah, you're suffering. Um, But I think, you know, one very important aspect of the spiritual life for any Christian is to understand, um, well, one, how to make sense of your suffering. Because if you can't do that, um, I think things will go very badly for you spiritually. But then also to think about what is joyful and good in your life in terms of the broader theological Christian account of the human person and reality. And, you know, that's important both for understanding that whatever happiness you have right now, there is a deeper kind of happiness uh, that you're truly hoping for and living for. Uh, And it's always important to keep that in mind but also that your suffering isn't um, meaningless or worthless or not an important part of your spiritual life, that your suffering too um, is something that has to be understood sort of subspatii eternitatis, right? In terms of the bigger picture and the understanding of what your real fi- final end is. I mean, another kind of more philosophical way of putting it would be that, you know, your imperfect happiness is, is, um, 
a final natural end, but your perfect happiness is your ultimate supernatural end to which your natural end must always be ordered. I don't know if that was helpful. Yeah, that is helpful. No, certainly. And so putting that in kind of in conversation with your last response regarding psychological states and self-reporting as the current like kind of quantifiable outcomes assessment uh, standard for human happiness, mm-hmm. you know, like the language that you use specifically like of end, objectivity, et cetera, suggests to us that like human happiness is a thing to be like found and assimilated to speak about it in somewhat crass materialistic terms. But in the sense that like a, hu- a human happiness is a thing towards which we go out. <clears throat> it, and it's a thing with which we engage that subsequently, be, you know, like it becomes part of a human communion. At the, like in the most basic terms, mm-hmm. without kind of tipping my hat to Prima Secunde question two, article eight, it's something that, that begets a kind of conversatio, like there's a, there's a sharing in it. So it, it, it entails from yeah. us that we go out to it. And, and I think that, um, yeah, insofar as a lot of our psychological or sociological or economic studies of these particular questions are subject to certain standards of falsification or verification as a result of which they end up being, you know, pretty darn subjective as you have kind of brought to light. Maybe, maybe like in, in the, in the context of these more philosophical or theological conversations, what do you think are good ways in which to describe the good? Because I think when people hear the good in Christian conversation, they think of some monolithic thing out there. They assume, they, I mean, they just assimilate it immediately to God, which is right, right? But then it kind of ends the discourse. It's like, Bleh, Christians, they're just like thinking about God and that's the whole story. It's like, but what about, you know, like, I don't know, like living peaceably in society and procreation and education of children. I mean, family life has never been described so sexily as it is. And, you know, Prima Secunda, question 94. Um, and then like these other goods, which taken together kind of constitute the good, capital G sense, or are found in the good. What are ways that you have found argumentatively or strategically helpful for describing the good so as to kind of capture people's imaginations and draw them into a more realistic or metaphysically thick discourse? Well, I mean, I just sort of start with the basic idea that the good is the object of desire, right? Um, And to get people to think about its connection to appetite or wanting. Um, And, you know, when... And then get people to think about the different kinds of of wantings that they experience and to recognize that they're not all the same. Um, So if you think about desire, like two things immediately become clear. One is that you don't just desire, right? Like, oh, I'm I'm just desiring. (laughs) Like you always desire something, right? Desire has an intentionality. It's directed to something. It has to be directed to an object. Um, And you can learn a lot about somebody by learning what they desire. Um, But then we have different kinds of desires, right? We have just sensory desires um, over which, you know, we don't exercise as much control, right? I mean, we can control how we respond to those desires, but... Um, and and we can try to habituate our desires in certain way, but sensory desires are just, they just grow out of our sense, our sensory experiences, right? Like you smell something good and like, you know, you start salivating and you're like, oh, you know, I, you just feel drawn to it, um, in terms of wanting, wanting to eat it or wanting to drink it, whatever it is, uh, or even just wanting to keep looking at it right? That can be a kind of sensory desire. And then there are more complicated desires that are associated with what Aquinas would call the passions, or we might call the emotions. Um, And here we have like fear and anger um, and uh, other kinds of desires. Um, They're like bodily desires that you might speak of in terms of passions and then and then you have these rational desires right these desires that you only have because you can apply certain concepts and make certain judgments and then this creates all kinds of desires so um if you think about 
advertising, <laughs> the way that advertising functions, right? It's trying to create desires in you, um, but it's doing it by engaging your intellect in various ways. Um, it's trying to convince you that you really need something, you know, you're lacking something, you need this, wouldn't your life be better, etc. cetera. Um, and it's those rational desires, now we're talking about the will, um, those are the ones that we exercise the most control over. But when you think about the good, you're just thinking about the object of your desires, like what's appetible, what's attractive, what's good. And um, the thing is, obviously not everything we desire is really good on the whole, uh, but there's always something about it that's good. So this is something that I think is is just a very deep human truth that both Aristotle and Aquinas acknowledge, right? That we go for the good, even if it's only the apparent good. So if you look at St. Thomas on vice, right? People who are vicious, right? People who are greedy and proud <laughs> and full of wrath, um, they are still pursuing goods. They are simply pursuing them in a disordered way, right? And so um, we don't necessarily go wrong in life because um, we're pursuing evil, right? Or we're just attracted to evil or, or we're monsters or something. It's that we're not pursuing the good in accordance with right practical reasoning. Um, and... And that, I mean, that's virtue right there, right? You have to have, uh, you have to have a well-ordered understanding of not only what is really and truly good in the situation, like how do you get in that condition where you can recognize what's really true and good for me to do here and now? Um, well, you have to have a general understanding of what's good for human beings um, in a well-ordered way. So not all human goods are on a par, right? So for example, health is not the most important good. It's a good, it's important. Um, but there are goods that are more important than health. And sometimes it is very rational to sacrifice your health or your personal safety for the sake of a greater good. Um, so you have to understand what I would just call the hierarchy of goods and how they're ordered in, in a good life. Um, and then, you know, and again, this is a teaching from St. Thomas and Aristotle and Plato too, to a certain extent. Um, you have to have, you have to be well habituated, right? So uh, it's not enough to be smart. Um, it's good to be smart, but it's not enough to be smart. You have to want the right things. And that actually takes effort. That's what an education is for. A real education is for habituating you so that you are attracted to what is really and objectively good for you rather than what's like apparently good for you. So anybody who's raised kids or like babysat or even just been around small humans for some modicum of time knows that like little kids... Uh, are very bad uh, judgers of what they should be doing in any given situation, right? Like they want to eat the whole bag of candy now. And you're like, no, you're, you're going to puke if you do that. <laughs> like, um, and sometimes they do it anyway. And then they throw up and you're like, well, I told you you were going to vomit. Um, and, but like you have to be there to be like, no, you can have like two pieces of candy. And that's it. Like, uh, I realize you want them all. I realize it tastes good, but there are these reasons and that reasons. And then, you know, they just learn over time to, I don't know, indulge. <laughs> indulge correctly or something. Um, but also to recognize, like, what's dangerous for them. What, I mean, this is just like a huge process. It's amazing how long it takes to get a human to the point where they can just not constantly be in danger of dying. <laughs> like, it's like, 
I mean, it's real. It's like you look at other animals. It's like you look you look at horses and like they they literally come out and they just start kind of doing their horse thing and you're like, wow, like babies come out and they can literally do nothing. It's like it's just wow. <laughs> they don't come out walking and going to get something to drink and that does not happen. Anyway. The, the cost of having a big that? brain. I was, supposed to, I was supposed to explain the good. It's the object of desire, Fonda, and that's what the good is. <laughs> yeah. That's where you start, because it's true. Um, it is. Yeah. I want to ask one, one final question and kind of bring it like fully into the realm of virtue, which we have kind of made mention of or alluded to at a variety of points now in the conversation. Um, so I'm interested in bringing together a couple of the things that you've mentioned under this aspect. So... Um, okay, so there's a variety of goods by which we are attracted. And then you mentioned the fact that we aren't necessarily attracted to those goods in a way that's healthy or in a way that's humane. And so we need an education in the good or we need to be disciplined in the good. We need a kind of moral formation in the good. We're always attracted to something under the aspect of the good. But sometimes we can supplant that hierarchy which you described or we can um, go about it in a disorderly way so that we end up preferring lower things to higher things not just in an abstract general yes. order, but as they pertain to us, you know, like in our particular and concrete lives and according to our own vocation. So to suss yeah. out some of these things, um, yeah, just describe for us a little bit virtue under this aspect of, you know, it's, it's what trains you in the good, it's what disciplines you in the good, it what's, it's what helps you to kind of come into full possession of your freedom, it, it teases out the implications of your own vocation, it institutes a kind of hierarchy or order in your life, like, you've, 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 yeah, you've, you've adduced a variety of principles and arguments at this point, yeah, just, just sing us a song uh, of virtue <laughs> to kind of round out the story. Yeah, well, this um, phenomenon that you mentioned of choosing a lesser good to a higher good, I mean, that just is sinning right there, right? <laughs> um, that is just the most basic definition of sin is when you choose a lesser good over um, over a greater good. And, um, and we do this. And uh, we do it in different ways. Right. Sometimes we do it because we're dumb. We're ignorant. Like we just don't know that it's a lesser good. Um, that's the least interesting kind of sinning that goes on. Um, sometimes we do it in full knowledge that it's a lesser good. So why would anyone do that? Well, um, you know, we're very passionate creatures and sometimes our passions uh, get in the way of following through or kind of like executing the commands of right practical reasoning so it's like you know I know I know I shouldn't have more candy but man it tastes good <laughs> like, and then you just keep eating and then you know you feel sick and disgusting and you're like why did I do that you hate yourself everybody knows that this everyone has experienced this um and the reason why this, I mean, this is, um, you know, so-called weakness of will or acrosia, um, but it's basically just when an out of control passion kind of subverts the work of reason, right? So you go with passion, um, you know, even, even, even St. Peter, right? <laughs> Denies Christ out of overwhelming fear of death, right? Um, and as soon as the threat of death subsides, he goes outside and weeps, you know, like he sees what he's done clearly, but it was fear of death, right. That made him forget. So this is very common. Um, but I think the trickiest way that we sin is out of malice. Right? Where it's like, it's not because you don't know, and it's not because you have a disordered desire. Uh, you just have a bad will, right? Um, and, and that's, that's kind of like the, the worst way to sin because it's the most fully voluntary way to sin. And we can do that too. Um, obviously as a Catholic, I believe in original sin. Um, and I think we're fallen and I think, you know, in a way human nature is like wounded. It's not totally depraved. I don't believe that at all. Uh, but it's like wounded. It needs help. And, you know, that's where virtue comes in, right? You need to kind of, um, 
you need to get yourself into a condition where it is less likely that you will have a bad will, um, that you will have disordered passions, and that you will uh, be ignorant of something. Um, And so virtues, in the most basic sense, are stable dispositions of thought, action, and feeling. Um, that regulate the so-called principal powers of the soul, right? So you've got your intellect and your will, which are your intellectual powers. Um, And then you have these lower appetites, right? Which Aquinas calls the concusable and the irascible appetites. But you could just think of, I mean, you could just think of like, I've also got these bodily (laughs) needs and passions, right? Um... And those things need to come to be habituated uh, so that they all work for the sake of a single end, namely for living well. Um, So what virtue does is it kind of gets all of the principal powers of the soul, the powers that are capable of being exercised voluntarily, And not all the powers of the human soul are like this, but the ones that are so that you can live well, right? That's how they function. And so when Aquinas talks about the cardinal virtues, he's talking about um, those virtues that regulate those four principal powers of the soul. So we have um, practical wisdom uh, in the intellect. We have, or prudentia, we have uh, a justice and the will, and we have temperance and the concupiscible appetite, and we have fortitude and the irascible appetite. And all the other virtues for Aquinas are going to be, well, except for the theological virtues, are going to be uh, subsumed under one of those four uh, cardinal virtues. And yeah, I mean, there's just no way of being happy in the imperfect sense, in the natural sense, outside of virtue. Uh, no, no chance. Boom. There it is. The final, <laughs> the final word is either so, or, and the or is not good. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, Cheers. it's sort of like, um, you know, I mean, what are the odds you're going to win the race if you... If you don't practice the sport, if you don't have the dispositions for, I mean, it's the same way in life. Like it's not going to go well unless you've trained yourself uh, so that it's even possible for it to go well. Um, I mean, it's, it's the same, you know, when we're talking about cultivating a a human life, um, it's not just a given, like it's something that has to be whipped into shape. Right. And the only question is, well, what sort of shape are you going to give it? Um, and personally, I'm convinced that the virtues are, are the correct shape. Yeah, uh, for sure. And actually, just as a recommendation to anybody who's listening to this, uh, Joseph Pieper, P-I-E-P-E-R, has this wonderful little book. It's not scholarly on the cardinal virtues that... Um, I read as an undergrad and it just, it was, it was so amazing. I loved it. Highly recommend. Yeah. It's the best. Um, one of like a controlling image that I've been using recently to describe our lives, like grace, virtue, gifts, of the Holy Spirit in the context of God's providence as trained on virtue or excuse me, as trained on happiness is like to think about ourselves mm-hmm. as kind of seated around the poker table and you might be dealt a bad hand. <laughs> Which is to say, like, right. you might be born in a time, place, setting, circumstance, which isn't propitious. And you might have, like, a pretty rough formation as concerns family and school and friends and intermediate institutions and yada yada and thus and such. And, like, many bad things may have happened along the way. Like, your, your life, objectively speaking, may not look like other lives uh, through no fault of your own. And yet, there's still a kind of, you know, freedom you, you know, like, you can learn to play the game and you can learn to play it better and better. And then, even when you are dealt bad cards, you know, like the proverbial 7-2 offsuit, you can still play it with a modicum of facility, confidence, and um, you can still, yeah, you can still, you can still do it well, which is to say, like, you can attain to a certain happiness, even within the context of time, place, setting, and circumstance, which isn't that good. 
um, because it's never such that the game is rigged to towards your damnation, right? So it's never, it's never such. Um, but often the game is subtle, it's textured, it's nuanced. So it's not going to be like everyone wins who tries. It's like not going to be like that, right? But you can make of it something beautiful. And I think that's part of the, yeah, part of the drama of grace, virtue, gifts of the Holy Spirit, human life as we are kind of shot towards, as Joseph Pieper says, shot towards our end, uh, but make adjustments mid-flight. <laughs> yeah, and this is, I mean, you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm a Thomist and not just an Aristotelian. I mean, there is something pessimistic in Aristotle in the sense that it's pretty clear that he thinks there are a lot of hopeless cases, right? Where, because Aristotle just thinks that precisely because he doesn't have room for grace, uh, he doesn't have robust room for grace in his account. Um, you know, if you're not, if you're dealt a bad hand, uh, yeah, that stinks, but it's probably not going to work out for you. Um, you know, and I think that, I mean, like, like you can imagine, like, giving uh, a young prisoner the Nicomachean Ethics, <laughs> Right. And he might feel like, oh, well, it's just over for me. <laughs> right. Like, because I've, you know, there's no way for me to recover like the things I was never given. Whereas if you gave like a young prisoner, St. Thomas, uh, they would have a lot of reason to hope. And that is because for St. Thomas, no matter how bad, it's always better to be raised well. I mean, nobody wants to deny this. Right. It's always better to be raised well. But suppose that you weren't, right? Um, or suppose you find yourself midway through life, like Ebenezer Scrooge or something, and you just realize, I am a complete jerk. <laughs> like, 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 I am not living well. You know, um, once you have a robust room for the theological virtues, which we haven't really talked about, but now we're talking about God's grace working in and through you and you cooperating with it, then like there's no, there's nothing that is impossible for you, no matter how bad it is. And that I think, one, I think it's true, but two, I just think it's enormously <laughs> consoling <laughs> in a way that reading Aristotle will never be, right? I mean, um, yeah. You're not, there's never a hopeless case. There's never a hopeless case. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is great. This helped me for sure. I hope that it's helpful to our listeners. Um, and yeah, I look forward to, you know, having future conversations along these lines. Um, so maybe if you, if you wouldn't mind just by way of send off, could you highlight a couple of places where listeners can find your work? Um, what for, uh, or, you know, if you have a podcast, for instance, things like that. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention my podcast. I'm so bad at promoting myself. Okay, so <laughs> you should... I have a podcast, and it's really great. <laughs> you should definitely listen to it. Uh, and Father uh, Father Pine's been on my podcast, so uh, I think it was episode 18 on Cormac McCarthy. You should definitely listen to that. Um, Sacred and Profane Love. So you can go to www.sacredandprofanelove.com. I have a fancy, amazing new website. Um, and you can find the entire archive of all my past episodes, a list of all my guests. Um, there's a blog on it now. Uh, we're finally on episode 50. So it's like, it's like a milestone. Um, so yeah, so I do that. And then, um, you can also find me, uh, for my academic stuff. You can just go to jenniferannfray.com, a less amazing website, but you can find my CV. And, <laughs> like that. and of course you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Jen Frey and the podcast is also on Twitter where our handle is at eudaimoniapod. That's awesome. All right. Well, to yeah. our listeners, thanks so much for tuning into this episode. Um, yeah, we're interested in uh, answering the questions that you are posing or, you know, kind of tailoring these episodes to, yeah, the types of conversations that you're having amongst uh, those with whom you listen to the podcast. So feel free to drop in a comment like, yeah, this is great in the future. Maybe this, maybe that. We're, we're super interested in fielding those requests and incorporating them in future episodes. 
So be sure to like, to subscribe, to leave a five-star review, and then check out ThomisticInstitute.org for other events, like in-person events, for which you can be present, and then for the other programming, which will, uh, yeah, which will appear in due course. All right, so thanks so much. Uh, know of, yeah, our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we will catch you next time uh, on the Thomistic Institute podcast. Cheers. Cheers.